Hello, everyone. Welcome to our fourth session of the virtual Linesville Open House. I'm Andy Desco. I'm just the producer for our segments here. I'm going to be handing over the microphone to Chad Foster in a second. He's going to be interviewing Tim Wilson about the Pima tuning fishery. And uh, just as we're getting started here, uh, I'd like to remind everybody about our social media policy, our user policy. Please keep your questions relevant to the topic. If you have other great questions about fishing or boating in Pennsylvania, you can go over to our website and check the fishing hole account. Or, you know, if you have a question that does end up in uh, as a status update underneath this piece presentation, we'll try to get back to those and, and answer your question as soon as we can. I'd uh, just like to take a minute and talk to everybody about our uh, Hunt Fish PA app and our website. So if you are looking to purchase a fishing license, if you haven't purchased it in a while or you're new to purchasing a fishing license, please go over to huntfish.pa.gov. We have a user-friendly features on there for faster transactions. You can buy your fishing license, you can renew your boat registration, and you can get your launch permits for your paddle craft. So please check that out huntfish.pa.gov. I'm going to take just a second to make sure we have everything queued up and ready to go, and then I'm going to pass the microphone to Chad Foster. Okay, Chad, when you're ready, take it away. Thanks, Andy. Uh, welcome, everybody. This is a segment that we're going to talk to Tim Wilson, the uh, Area 1 Fisheries Management fisheries biologist for the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. He covers Pyman Tuming, some Presque Isle Bay, and other water bodies here in Northwestern PA. So thank you for attending this, Tim. And, uh, you know, we appreciate you taking the time to answer some questions after we watch this video. So this is going to be a video on the different species in Pyman Tuming, and uh, we hope you all enjoy. Go ahead, Andy. My name is Tim Wilson. I'm a fisheries biologist with the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. My presentation today is on the status of fish populations in Pima Tuning Reservoir. Let's get started. Pima Tuning Reservoir was built in 1933 to supply cooling water to the heavy industry in Sharon. The lake encompasses about 14,000 acres and straddles the Pennsylvania and Ohio state line. Both states, Pennsylvania and Ohio, maintain a Pima Tuning State Park and the adjoining Sanctuary Lake adds an additional 2,500 acres. The sanctuary is closed to all public access. It is owned by the Pennsylvania Game Commission and they use it for waterfowl production. It is also the location of our Linesville State Fish Hatchery and the Sanctuary Lake contains most of our warm water brood for the state. The maximum depth of Pine Tuning Reservoir is about 30 feet down near the dam. The lake is bisected by a causeway, and north of the causeway, the maximum depth is about 18 feet. During summer, the lake does thermally stratify in mid to late summer, uh, which means that the bottom or hypolimnion will eventually go anoxic, and this will dictate the location and activity of the fish in mid to late summer, and anglers should take that into account. The lake is jointly managed by the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission and the Ohio Division of Wildlife and all management decisions have to be approved by both states before any regulation can take effect. Pima Tuning Lake maintains outstanding fisheries, most of which are maintained through natural reproduction, including largemouth and smallmouth bass, channel catfish, black and white crappies, yellow perch, sunfish, brown and yellow bullheads, and white bass. The Two of the main fisheries in Pima Tuning, though, are stocked. The lake is stocked with walleye fingerlings at a rate of, of about 40 per acre, half of which are contributed each by Pennsylvania and Ohio. In addition to that, Pennsylvania stocks 4 million fry annually. Occasionally, one or both states will have surplus fingerlings, which were also stocked in Pima Tuning Reservoir. Fingerling stocking only began in 2008. Prior to that, the walleye population was maintained through walleye fry stocking, but changes in the forage base and the predator base uh, 
reduce the survival of our walleye fry, forcing us to switch to fingerlings. Uh, the other stock fishery that anglers are familiar with are the muscalunge. Uh, we've made recent changes to our muscalunge program in 2018. We switched from a fall fingerling to a much, more lar uh, much larger and more robust spring yearling. Uh, these fish survive much better, so we now stock those at a rate of 0.75 yearlings per acre and only in even numbered years. So it was stocked with 10,450 yearlings in 2018 and in 2020. The reason for these outstanding fish populations uh, in Pima Tuning Reservoir is it's very diverse and very dense forage base. The top three species being gizzard shad, alewives, and spot tail shiners. In addition to these, there are also spot fin shiners, brook silver sides, golden shiners, blunt nosed minnows, and banded killifish. You can see in the pictures to the right, the top picture is three year classes of alewives. And the bottom picture has a, gold, a golden shiner, a yellow perch, a spot tail shiner, and one alewife and one gizzard shad. In addition to these forage species, the juvenile panfish of the lake also are, are popular forage for our sport fish, including small yellow perch, small crappies, and small bluegills. Less significant, but also present, are juvenile white suckers and red horse suckers, common carp and quillback. The numbers I will present today are based upon the fish sampling performed by my office. Each spring, we perform a trap net survey targeting mostly walleye and muscalunge. We also perform an annual fall night electrofishing survey to index the survival of our stocked walleyes, and we, we collect walleye young of the year. About every third year, we perform spring night electrofishing to index our bass populations. In addition to our fish sampling, we also perform temperature and dissolved oxygen profiles, basic water quality measurements. We occasionally perform shoreline seining to index young of the year fish that aren't caught by other equipment. And recently, we've been assisting DCNR with aquatic vegetation assessments, which has become a big deal in recent years. So let's start with the abundance of fish in the lake. Uh, here is the the top three forage species we talked about, gizzard shad, spot tail, shiners, and alewives. The big takeaway here is to notice that prior to 2000, we rarely saw an alewife in Pima Tuning Lake, and something changed, and they began to emerge and grow in density to eventually peaking in 2013, but the, the emergence of the alewife uh, had, had cascading effects not through just the forage fish, but also through the predatory fish. And remember that time frame, the early 2000s, when uh, alewives arrived, because we'll talk about that when we talk about other species. Walleyes are probably the most popular fish with anglers in Pima Tuning Reservoir. This graph represents their population trends through time since 1989. Uh, a lot of the old timers considered the walleye heyday back in the 90s, but if you can see from recent trap net results, the heyday is right now. Uh, not only has the abundance of walleye changed, but many of the key characteristics of the population have changed. They grow faster, they live longer, and the average size has increased from 14 inches to around 18 or 19 inches these days. And the thing for anglers to remember is the tactics that catch 14 and 15 inch walleyes are not necessarily the best tactics to catch 18 and 20 inch walleyes. They uh, utilize different parts of the forage base and often they school by size. So if you, what you're doing is catching small walleyes or not catching walleyes at all, change your tactics. Go to a bigger bait, a faster moving bait and change location. Uh, but right now, like I said, the heyday for walleye fishing is right now. Well, how did we get here with uh, walleyes? Uh, as I stated, for years we stocked walleye fry, and walleye fry produced outstanding populations. However, with the emergence of alewives in the early 2000s, alewives again are a known predator of walleye fry which really reduced the survival of our stocked fish. 
beginning in 2008, we switched to stocking fingerlings. And in addition to the stocking of fingerlings and the changes in the forage base, we are now uh, getting excellent returns on our, our walleye stocked fingerlings. And the high point is if you notice 2019 and 2020, we have two outstanding year classes entering the fishery, which means in 2021, there are a lot of eight to 14 inch fish in the system. But in the future, those fish will uh, mature to legal size and out, uh, walleye fishing should be really good for the next several years. Uh, while these fish are sublegal, if you catch them, please release them gently. They're the future of our fisheries. Our other fishery maintained through stocking is the muscalunge fishery. Uh, if you have been fishing for muscalunge and pima tuning for many years, you'll probably recall the collapse of the population back in the late 80s and early 90s due to the uh, introduction of red spot disease. Uh, since then, we have uh, improved our fingerling stocking and, and now our yearling stocking. And you can see that the population has rebounded through the 90s and 2000s and has kind of hit a peak. Uh, we expect the stocked yearling to uh, continue to improve the fishery. And so we expect the muscalunge fishery to improve in both quantity and quality through time. Perhaps the second most popular fishery in Pima Tuning Reservoir is for black and white crappies. Uh, you can see through their population trends through time that again, may or may not be related to the emergence of the alewives, but prior to 2000, we know that crappies were a prime forage for the walleyes and the bass. Once they started shifting to alewives as a forage, uh, the crappies saw a release from predation and have increased in abundance and quality through time. Uh, at, at that point, we noticed a very high angler use and angler harvest of crappies. And so in 2017, we instituted panfish enhancement regulations for crappies. So crappies and pima tuning are now regulated with a 20 fish creel limit, all of which must be over nine inches in minimum size. Uh, this has not, it's too early to tell if this has produced positive results, but we know the anglers are very receptive to the new regulation and crappies remain a very popular fishery in pima tuning. Again, very similar with the yellow perch, the emergence of the alewives and the shift in predation uh, released uh, the yellow perch and they have gradually increased in density. Uh, the increase in quality is a little bit slower to happen. Uh, uh, anglers are harvesting a large number of yellow perch, uh, but uh, the population is, is as good now as it's ever been. And uh, they've become a very popular fishery now where 30 years ago, they were almost unheard of. We see with bluegills, perhaps a slightly different uh, trend in abundance over time. Uh, prior to 2000, they were uh, quite abundant with good quality. And then they went through a, a rather long period of poor quality and poor abundance. Uh, but then again, uh, perhaps a change in forage or a change in predation uh, resulted in a rather large increase in abundance and quality of bluegills. And they are again, a, a very abundant and good quality fishery available to anglers. Uh, they are probably not as popular as the yellow perch and the crappies, but they uh, are a good target if you're looking to take some fish home deep because there are plenty of quality size fish available. Bass have changed dramatically over time. Uh, when uh, Air Fisheries Management Area 1, which manages the lake, was created in 1989, the, the fish popu uh, bass population was dominated by smallmouth bass and had a rather small component of largemouth bass. Again, a shift through time, we see a dramatic increases in the abundance of largemouth bass, where the smallmouth have kind of stayed steady and are now much lower in density. Uh, it is a very popular bass lake. Pima Tuning Lake is the only lake open to bass fishing tournaments during the tr uh, traditional catch and release season. And so it sees a, a high use for anglers for bass, especially in the spring. Channel catfish is another emerging fishery. Uh, we 
The Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission has not stocked channel catfish in Pima Tuning Reservoir since 1995. But again, some type of change in the early 2000s uh, produced changes in the channel catfish population and they continued to expand through natural reproduction, peaking in 2013. Uh, right now, they're on a slightly downward trend in abundance. Uh, the thing to note about channel catfish is that they are very slow growing and very long lived in Pima tuning. On average, a 12 inch fish is going to be five years old and a 15, 16 inch fish is going to be eight or nine years old. So uh, they're very slow growing and long lived and uh, they are growing in popularity. We now have catfish tournaments on Pima tuning reservoir and they're a nice addition to the fishery. Uh, most everybody is, a, is familiar with the, the Pima tuning spillway where the ducks walk on the fish and people throw bread to the, to the carp. Uh, things have changed for carp over the last five years, uh, starting with 2017, the arrival of a koi herpes virus killed a substantial portion of the, the carp in the lake. Uh, and then a, a second virus showed up in 2019, carp edema virus, and that killed even more carp. Uh, this reduced the overall density of carp in Pima tuning, uh, which also resulted in faster growth and larger average size. So if you go to the, the Pima tuning spillway now to feed the carp, it will look somewhat different than what you see in this picture. This picture was before the mortality events and you can see a lot of small carp. Now there are fewer carp, but they are much, much bigger. And there are still a lot of them there, but not quite in the density you see in this picture. Habitat improvement, a joint effort between the Pima Tuning Lake Association, the Fish and Boat Commission, and the Ohio Division of Wildlife has resulted in the placement of hundreds of fish concentrating structures throughout the lake over the last 25 or 30 years. Uh, this map is available on the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission website under habitat maps, and it gives the type of structure, the year it was placed, and the latitude and longitude of those structures so that you can find them. They are really good fish holding structures, especially in mid to late summer. In addition to these fish concentrating structures, uh, this same group of organizations has done some large scale habitat improvement, including uh, shoreline stabilization around Snodgrass, Wilson Boat Launch, the Groot Camping Area, which has turned these formerly very shallow, weedy areas into deeper, really good shoreline fishing destinations. And uh, like I said, if you need that map, it is available on the Fish and Boat Commission website. And Perhaps our biggest challenge in management right now is the arrival of multiple aquatic invasive species in Pima Tuning Reservoir. The two big ones right now are hydrilla, an, an aquatic invasive plant, and white perch, which is a fish from uh, the Atlantic drainage and has been introduced in various parts of the state now. They are present in Lake Erie and in Kinzu Reservoir. Hydrilla, the state park has spent quite a bit of money trying to control hydrilla and they finally have it mostly under control, but it will require constant vigilance to keep it from becoming the nuisance that it has the potential to be. It can really interfere with fishing and boating and it is quite poor fish habitat when compared to other aquatic plants. The white perch are known predators of the, the eggs of some of our more popular sport fish. When they end up in reservoirs like this, they have a tendency to stunt. And so basically they become little bait stealers that are uh, unattractive to most anglers. If you know how to identify white perch versus the native white bass, remember that there is no limit, no size limit, no creel limit on white perch and feel free to kill all that you catch. But make sure you meet, know how to identify them before you do that. Other species that have been uh, been introduced over the years, bowfin, lwives, which we've talked about, Chinese mystery snails, a new plant which has a very big potential to be a negative is a European frog bit. 
Eurasian water milfoil was the predominant plant in Pima tuning before hydrilla, and it is reemerging. Uh, if you've seen a, a, a big bushy plant in shallow water, that is another invasive called Southern Naiad. And in certain areas, uh, curly leaf pond weed is also present. Uh, the introduction of these species has the potential to change the food web, the predator-prey relationships, and, and be real hindrances to angling and boating. So we uh, again ask that you clean all of your gear when coming to or leaving Pima Tuning Reservoir. Thank you very much for listening and watching. And we'll now go to an online discussion where I'll be able to answer your questions. Again, thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Tim, for that great presentation on the Pamituming fishery. And uh, it's just a, a great fishery we have here in the northwest of Pennsylvania. And a lot of anglers come here every year to target plenty of those species that you talked about. So I've got a few questions already. Uh, so let's get started with some of the question and answer period for you. Okay. okay. <clears throat> So if someone in, in college or just really looking to change their their uh, career, wanted to get in with the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission, possibly as a fisheries biologist, what advice do you have uh, to give them? Well, to be a fisheries biologist, you really have to start by attending college and acquiring a bachelor of science degree in one of the biological fields, preferably fisheries science, but uh, we have guys who with regular biology degrees and environmental biology, things like that. Uh, and uh, getting as much varied work experience as you can while you're getting your degree, spend your summers. Uh, the Fish and Boat Commission hires fisheries biologist aides for the summer. That's a very good way to get experience. Uh, get your degree, get good grades. Uh, there's a trend now towards a lot of Guys are getting master's degree. That's very helpful. Uh, but uh, varied work experience, you know, we've, we've had a lot of people who've worked around different parts of the country and then come back to Pennsylvania to become fisheries biologists. Uh, we have a fair number of guys who, after getting their degree, joined uh, the Fish and Boat Commission as fish culturists and worked in the fish culture side of things for quite a few years before uh, jumping into the fisheries management side of the of the agency. And so there are mar multiple ways in, but the first thing you got to do is get that degree and get good grades and get as much uh, work experience uh, as you possibly can. Perfect. And is there any uh, internships with the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission or seasonal jobs in fisheries? Yes, uh, most fisheries management offices hire one or more what we call fisheries biologist aides. Uh, it is a paid position that lasts approximately uh, 20 pay periods, five months, and you get to work in a fisheries management office and you're, you'll be standing right next to me doing everything I do for the entire field season. And so that's that's the best way to get to know the Fish and Boat Commission and it's how, it's, uh, how we get to know you and uh, a large number of our biologists spent some time as a fisheries biologist aide early in their career with the Fish and Boat Commission. Uh, some offices also offer unpaid internships if uh, that's something you can afford to do and want to do if, and, and get some experience with the Fish and Boat Commission, you can volunteer. And again, you'll be doing uh, lots of field work right alongside uh, the biologists. Perfect. That's that's what I was thinking, but I wanted to definitely elaborate on that a little bit. Um, so, Pima Tuming Reservoir is known by anglers for having several good fish populations, such as muskie and walleye and crappie and largemouth bass. In your opinion, which one draws the most anglers to the area and why? Uh, far and wide, it's the walleyes. Uh, it outside of Lake Erie, it's probably the the densest walleye population in the state. And it's probably the best bet you have for catching a limit of walleyes. Uh, so that draws the most anglers. And uh, if you're going to fish for walleye, you really need to uh, target them when they're most catchable, uh, which is spring, early summer, fall, and through the ice. 
Uh, they can be a little tough to catch at the height of summer, say July and August, late July and August, uh, because the, the lake does get very warm and it does stratify, uh, which means that uh, there's a thermocline and the water below the thermocline will go in oxics. And so they're kind of trapped in that warm water layer and uh, they can be rather difficult to catch when the water gets very, very warm. So basically right now, uh, it's April 15th or so. Uh, it's a little early this year, but the walleye appear to be done spawning and are now uh, spreading out and turning onto their typical spring mode. And they should be foraging very heavily and they should be their most catchable right about now for the next month and a half to two months. Very good. That's an excellent point to help out all those anglers out there that target walleye, especially in Pimatuman. Uh, so another species, uh, let's talk about an underutilized species in Pennsylvania or in Pimatuming. Which one would that be? Uh, that would be the channel catfish. Uh, I actually get complaints from anglers about catching so many catfish, uh, but Basically, the way it works is we're kind of favoring channel catfish because anglers, for the most part, take home every walleye they catch, every legal walleye, and they throw back every catfish that they catch. And uh, so they continue to expand in abundance. Uh, they're, they're getting quite large in size. Uh, the average size is, is probably over 20 inches now. Uh, we had one net this week that had three, three channel catfish over 32 inches in it. So uh, there's, there's quite a number of fish out there. Uh, I encourage people to utilize them. I, I, I eat the ones that I catch. Uh, so if you know how to prepare them, they are quite good to eat. And so instead of saying, uh, caught another darn catfish, you know, put it on a stringer, throw it in a creel, give it a try, see if you like it. Uh, they are one of the most popular farmed fish in the United States for human consumption. So you know, they, they can be cooked and eaten and uh, enjoyed. So uh, I, I encourage people to try, try out the catfish fishing. Uh, they fight well, they get very big. Uh, it's something that most people, well, it's, it's growing in, in popularity too. We now have approximately four catfish tournaments a year on the lake. Uh, and there's also bullheads. And recently we're, we're starting to get flathead catfish show up. So the catfish continue to expand. Uh, I encourage anglers to utilize them. As far as in your traps and stuff like that, you said you just uh, brought most of those in this past week and, and we're over there studying the lake. What was the biggest uh, flatted catfish you may might have saw this year? Is that uh, well, we, never, we hardly get uh, the channel catfish. The channel catfish come the reports that come from anglers. Uh, I had a guy stop by the net and he asked me, what are you catching? And I said, well, we're catching a lot of this and a lot of that and a lot of catfish. And he said, oh, those catfish. And then he told me he caught a 30 pound flathead last summer. And I'm thinking, well, what else did you catch in Pima tuning that was 30 pounds? Uh, so they're there to be enjoyed. Uh, they're not, the flatheads are not very dense, uh, but they are, they are expanding. Uh, they seem to be expanding a lot of places. Shenango has an expanding uh, flathead catfish fishery. Uh, the Shenango River downstream of Shenango Dam is expanding. So uh, flatheads seem to be uh, growing in abundance and popularity in Area 1. Perfect. Um, if someone wants to learn more about the Pimatuming fishery or, or any fishery for that matter in Pennsylvania, where is a good place to start? Biologist reports, habitat maps, things like that? I'd say yes, start with the biologist reports. Uh, I will write a summary of our survey every year and post it on on our fish on the Fish and Boat Commission website as a web report for uh, Pima tuning. There's one for every year except for 2020. We, uh, we, we lost 2020 because of the pandemic. Uh, and I will write a summary of this year's survey soon and, and it will be posted to the website. Yes, the habitat map uh, will help you find uh, all those artificial structures that are uh, placed in the lake. Those, are, those can be especially good for panfish in the summer. Uh, Ohio has a, a pretty good quality uh, depth chart map uh, uh, available on their website. Uh, if you buy one of the hotspot maps, those are okay, uh, but 
that's a, like a, I think a five or 10 foot interval. The Ohio map is a three foot contour interval and it gives you a little more definition of the, the bottom of the lake. And you can see some of the, the more popular uh, submerged humps that are very good for uh, uh, walleye this time of year, good for muskies a lot of the year. Uh, you can see the shallow bays and where the lotus are, which is some of the prime spots for, uh, for crappies. And so, uh, yes, maps are very helpful. And uh, I always say, if, if you can go fishing with somebody who knows pima tuning or somebody who's an expert or very good at catching a particular species, that is an outstanding way to learn how to fish for. If you're not familiar with walleye, go with somebody who knows how to fish for walleye. And, and, and that's probably the really best way to shorten the learning curve instead of trial and error. I got you. Um, what do you enjoy most about your job as a area one fisheries biologist? And what are some of the things that you're least favorite about? Well, I mean, the, the fun part is handling all the fish. I mean, it's, it's really exciting to go out and see what's in each and every trap net every day. It's, it's really cool to see what comes up as we do our electro fishing runs, uh, pulling a seine, seeing all the, the fish species that most people don't even know exist or, you know, backpack electrofishing in a stream and finding a wild trout where we didn't think wild trout existed or didn't know. And so that, that part of the job is still just uh, as exciting today as it was on the very first day. Uh, the, the less exciting stuff is, you know, once we get done with our field season, all that stuff has to be written up, analyzed and turned into reports and submitted. So, you spend uh, almost as much time behind the computer in the winter as you do out on the water in the summer. So uh, it's, it's part of the job. You have to be uh, competent at it and, you know, you have to know the math and the statistics and all the, the, the basic biology. So uh, you can't, you can't do the job unless you can report the results to the public and to your, to your supervisors. Yeah, I've I've been out on the boat with you several times over the years and also with Brian Ensign and helped you uh, with trap netting and, and electroshocking. And I've seen firsthand exactly the amount of work and the amount of passion you guys have for, for doing the job that you do for all the anglers across Northwest PA and, and surveying all these fisheries that we have. I mean, we're we're lucky to have, uh, you know, Prescott Bay in our backyard, Pima Tuming and all of these lakes that are just tremendous fisheries in this part of the state. So we appreciate all the hard work that you and your crew do for, for the anglers of Pennsylvania. Well, we're all fishermen too, so we're kind of working for ourselves. I have a vested interest in seeing uh, quality fisheries in my part of the state. Exactly. A couple more questions that I came up with earlier and then we'll we'll jump over to those ones from, from Facebook. So. Uh, what's the biggest challenge in managing the fishery in Pima Tuming Reservoir? Uh, I, I think I mentioned it. It's the biggest challenge is aquatic invasive species. Uh, what anglers really would most want is for the lake to say, stay the same from year to year to year. Uh, but every time one of these invasive species is introduced, it makes a change to the fishery, particularly the alewives. They change the entire food web in the lake. And it was beneficial to some species, uh, not not so beneficial to others. Uh, like for the walleye, it turned the walleye. Uh, they ate alewives, so they used different habitat. They had a different forage, and anglers couldn't find them. And so it actually made them harder to catch. And so you, there's more walleye, and there's more legal walleye now than there's probably ever been. Uh, in, over the last five years, and uh, but you know, angler catch rates are actually down a little bit because uh, they are harder to catch because they're very well fed, and they're utilizing habitats that we're not uh, really proficient at at fishing. Uh, when they're out following schools of alewives, that's a hard uh, target to catch. When they're associated with the bottom, when in feeding on perch. They're pretty easy to locate. You can drag a, a night crawler or a fat head along the bottom and you can catch walleyes. Uh, but nowadays that's that that habitat is dominated by perch and catfish. And you can catch walleyes that way. Uh, 
but if you're just targeting walleyes, perhaps trolling lures in the upper water column, uh, trying to find those schools of shad and schools of alewives. So every time an invasive species shows up, it causes sometimes small, sometimes big changes in the overall fish community. And uh, we wish we could keep it the same way year after year, but we're trying to maintain walleye fisheries, you know, like we showed. Uh, we used to stock nothing but walleye fry and got outstanding walleye populations out of those fry. Now we stock a few fry, but perhaps maybe 4% of the fish in the lake are the result of fry, and the vast majority are fingerlings. And fingerlings are more expensive and harder to produce, and we're at max capacity at our hatcheries. So uh, we're, we're lucky to get the fingerlings that we do in pima tuning, and, but that's what's necessary to maintain the fishery in the in the face of these aquatic invasive species uh if you saw what hydrilla was doing on the south end where i would i would challenge some of it was you couldn't even run a kayak through it was so dense and so thick that even a kayak paddle would get bound up in it you can't fish in it you can't boat in it and so you know we spent a lot of time and money getting or at least controlling hydrilla and if you fished here 30 years ago, there wasn't, there was one patch of lotus in the lake that was in the same spot. For some reason now it, it, it covers huge swaths of the north end and is expanding. So uh, the, the aquatic invasive species are making it very difficult to maintain quality fisheries, uh, at least some of them in the lake. So Jared mentioned this in one of the previous uh, segments yesterday, and he talked the difference between bowfin, which is a native fish species that we have in Pennsylvania, and the snakehead. Um, right. Obviously, bowfin are in, in Pymie, and they are native fish species, correct? They, they are in native. Uh, we believe they are native to this area. We're positive that they're native to Presque Isle Bay. Uh, we're... we're we're having uh, special archaeologists uh, whether or not they're native to this area, this drainage. They probably are, and so we treat them as a native species. However, up until about five years ago, they were not present in Pima Tuning Lake or Pima Tuning Sanctuary, and now they're showing up with regularity uh, in in both waters. Uh, they are, you know, say a prehistoric fish, uh, but they are they are uh, one. Only one single species in the genus, and uh, they, if you look at a picture, they really, other than a long dorsal fin, they don't really resemble snakehead, but uh, different coloration, totally different head, uh, head shape, and, uh, but uh, if you do catch a bow fin, uh, they are, they're, I, I would not consider them good to eat. I, I tried it once up in New York. It wasn't good. Uh, <laughs> so uh, they're they're more of a catch and release fishery. They do fight very well. Uh, they do uh, take artificial lures and bait. Uh, they are mostly a scavenger. Uh, so they eat a lot of dead stuff off the bottom. And so dead bait can be very effective for bowfin. Uh, they do have a pretty serious set of teeth on them. So uh, if you want to handle them you should be careful handling them and uh their their mouth is almost all solid bone and so you have to have extremely sharp hooks and probably a steel leader uh if you want to target them regularly they're also as you know abundant in conneaut lake and geneva swamp uh they have expanded throughout most of the french creek drainage since they first uh really started to expand and so you can get them in LaBeouf Lake and LaBeouf Creek and most of French Creek and any any waterways that are connected uh, Sugar Lake things like that uh, they're they're pretty much uh, ubiquitous throughout the French Creek drainage okay um, Colton from Facebook asks uh, why not stock walleye in lakes like Foster Sayers that lake would be an excellent walleye lake can you give a short brief description as to what you're looking for in when you're stalking with walleye and and the walleye plan just a brief overview uh well the thing with most of the waters in pennsylvania we have experimented with walleye stalking in the past 
and uh, we, and I'm pretty sure we've we've tried it in uh, Foster Sayers Lake. I just call it Sayers Lake, uh, and it probably the reason it is no longer stocked is because survival was not sufficient enough to continue warrant stocking. Uh, we we have a minimum uh, catch rates that stocked fish have to maintain in our nets or through electrofishing uh, to remain in the program. Uh, it's not cost effective to stock 50,000 fingerlings and have a, just a very minor fishery result. So we, when we stock, we're looking to create a fishery that anglers can target. I, you know, I can go there, fish for walleye and expect to catch a walleye. And so uh, I believe we've tried Foster's uh, Sayers Lake in the past, and uh, it probably did not result in a fishable population of walleye. That's, a, that's also a bit of a special case because of the extreme drawdowns uh, and, and other things that are going on there. Uh, but if you really want to know for sure, you need to call Jason Detter in Fisheries Management Area 3, and he can explain to you uh, how he manages so uh, Sayers Lake and explain to you why or why not he would want to stock walleye fingerlings there. Okay. Thanks, Tim, for that answer. Uh, Pauline from Facebook writes in, is it possible to stock spotted bass in the Allegheny Reservoir? I know it's not your your area, but has the Fish and Boat Commission ever considered stocking, say, the spotted bass in any waterways? I I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I, I know it's spotted bass are very rare in Pennsylvania. Uh, whether or not uh, they would be native or a suitable candidate for uh, Allegheny Reservoir, uh, I can't tell you that. Uh, that that would be Brian Ensign, who manages Kinzu Reservoir and or our warm water unit, uh, as to why uh, if or if spotted bass are a suitable candidate to be stocked in in Allegheny Reservoir. Okay, um, you discussed about the bass shift in Pymatuming, whereas in the early '90s it was smallmouth, and now it's all largemouth for pretty much. Do you have an idea as to why that is? What changes maybe over the years has resulted into that that shift? And can you elaborate? Well, it's it's more speculation on knowing the the, the preferred habitats of the bass. Uh, over the years, Pymatuning has become more and more weedy. Uh, there's a lot more aquatic vegetation than there used to be, uh, which is a preferred habitat for largemouth bass. If you if you look back at the numbers, the smallmouth bass haven't really all declined all that much. It's just that the largemouth bass have really dramatically expanded. Uh, I still catch, and most anglers who who fish for bass still catch pretty good numbers of smallmouth and 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 some big individuals, and so they're still there in good numbers. It's just that the largemouth bass have really taken off with the, the the change in habitat that prefers largemouth bass. The aquatic vegetation, you know, they're really good at eating bluegills and other fish that inhabit the vegetation. And so it's it's probably a, a shift in habitat over time uh, that has favored the the uh, largemouth. And and and, and they are fairly spatially separated. If you fish in the shallow, weedy areas, you'll catch largemouth bass. I fish some of the more, uh, in fact, weed free areas that have a rocky bottom and I catch a lot of smallmouth. So, uh, if you target the right habitat, you'll, you'll catch the particular bass that it prefers that habitat. Yeah, I mean, there's what a tournament every weekend on that that lake from early April to September, October for bass. I mean, it's a very heavily used bass fishing lake. In reviewing the uh, special activity permits, there's as many as three or four bass tournaments per weekend uh, through the traditional catch and release season. It's it's the only lake open to the bass tournaments from you know when, from when bass season closes to when it reopens in in June. So uh, there's I've seen as many as three or four on a single day, three or four over a weekend, uh, weekday tournaments. So yes, it gets very heavy use. Uh, but they're uh, for the, I think for the whole part, they are catch and release tournaments. They're, they catch, weigh and release. Uh, so uh, there's, 
as long as uh, the water temperature is appropriate, most of those fish do survive. And so it, uh, it, it is a, 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 a it continues to expand. I don't know if we've seen the peak or not. We hope to uh, sample the bass population this summer and see what uh, if there's any continued growth in either one of the uh, species. All right. Yeah, that's. I mean, bass fishing in in Northwest PA is is awesome here this time of the year, and then also throughout early summer to midsummer to to late. I mean, there's so many good fisheries up here, and and uh, just glad to have those in our backyard. So. Um, what advice can you give anglers that are, you know, trying to improve their fishing success in Pimatuming, no matter what fish species they're, they're targeting? Well, uh, say, first off, you, you should know some of the basic biology of the species you're after. If you're after walleye, uh, they prefer low light. So you should be targeting periods of low light, dawn, dusk or when there's a really good chop on the water. Uh, the, 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 the theory or myth of a walleye chop is true. Uh, the choppiness uh, breaks up the light penetration and, and can uh, have uh, walleyes more active. Uh, we all would love to fish on a bright sunny day with no wind when the boat control's easy, but if you're targeting walleye, those are probably the wrong conditions uh, for for success. Uh, you you wanna be out there. I've been doing some of the waiting at night at dusk and catching walleyes at dusk and a little bit after dark. Uh, right now, there's as much nighttime activity on the lake as there is daytime. Uh, if you go off uh, at, at dusk, you can see lots of boats out in the middle on the humps fishing for walleye. Uh, it, it helps to know the forage that they're, you know, the walleyes, uh, not all walleyes are doing the same thing at the same time. So you can probably catch some walleye in the weeds that are feeding on perch. You can probably catch some walleyes on the rocky humps that are feeding on uh, perch and, and spot tail shiners. And you can probably catch some trolling the open water on ones that feed on alewives. Uh, so knowing something about the fish you're fishing for, if you're looking for largemouth bass, well, largemouth bass are a structure oriented fish. They're going to be on the weed edges, in the weed pockets, associated with submerged wood. Uh, that's their, their ambush predators, that's where they're gonna be. Uh, crappies, uh, we know that very early in the spring, they seek out warm water. So they, they look for the shallow bays with warm water in late March and April. Uh, we know that they spawn when the water gets to about 65 degrees. And so we look for areas where crappies will spawn. Uh, at Pima Tuning, it's not a real secret because if you see where the packs of boats are, <laughs> they're there because they know where the fish are. Uh, if you're, you know, if, you, uh, if you're after musky, well, musky, uh, they eat a lot of the suckers and the carp and other bigger cylindrical forage. So that should tell you, you know, what type of lure to use and what type of habitat to target. So, uh, so if you're fishing for walleyes, uh, it really does make a difference if you can show up very early in the morning or show up later in the evening and fish the dusk and dark bite. Uh, for crappies, it really does pay to have a temperature gauge on your boat so you can find the shallow bay that's four or five degrees warmer than the main lake because that really does pull in a lot of crappies. Uh, looking around the edge of the the, the Perch really like to live in the weeds. Find the weed beds, the outer edge of the weed beds, and you can catch large numbers of perch. Uh, so knowing the habitat that the fish are after prefers can kind of steer you to where you, the, the areas of the lake you should be targeting. Awesome answer, uh, Tim. Um, as far as the the musky go, have you seen a lot in your trap nets here this this couple of last weeks that you were out on? On Pimey, have you seen a good return? I mean, I know that water temperature had to be warmer than it's probably been in in several years this time of the year. So, what kind of fish did you see in your nets? And and I know you'll be able to tell us more in depth later, obviously in the fall when you write your report and do all that. But any heads up on on kind of what you're seeing from this latest pool? Well, uh, first impressions: uh, the fish that were stocked in 2018 experienced outstanding survival. We caught a very, a, a large percentage of our catch was uh, 
28 to 32 inches. And uh, if, if, if it holds true, I, I won't know for sure until I look at the scales and, and determine the age. But if it holds true to the past, those are probably three-year-old fish that were stocked in 2018. And there, was, there is a lot of them out there. Uh, we, we started to catch the bigger uh, green and ripe females right at the end of our survey. Uh, right now, the hatchery is out collecting their brood stock uh, in the main lake, and they are getting really high numbers of, uh, of uh, larger females and, and muskies in general. The, the population appears to be very dense. Uh, I, I've talk, I've, you know, we're out on the water, talked to some musky fishermen. How many did you catch today? Three, four. One guy said, I caught 14 one day last week. So, uh, the number of small muskies is very, very, very high. Uh, the bigger fish are still there. Uh, we did see a little bit of uh, active red spot, but that's always been present. Uh, so the, the fishery is in outstanding condition, uh, but with a lot of small fish, which means the future is probably pretty bright uh, when those fish uh, grow, if they continue to grow at the uh, average rate for pine tuning. And you could say the same thing about the walleye too over the last few years, just the outstanding returns on on those younger ages of fish that will be good for the future years. Yes, the, the 2019 and the 2020 year classes were the two biggest we've seen since 1997. And so uh, the, the, the 2020 fish are about eight or nine inches right now. The 2019 fish are 13 and a half to 15 right now. And so when they fully recruit to the fishery, uh, it will kind of be like the old days. Uh, if you want, if you can go out and catch a lot of 15 inch crappies next year and the year after. And so the thing is now is they grow a lot faster. Uh, back before alewives, uh, a four year old fish was about 16 inches. Now a four year old fish is 20 inches. And so they grow very fast. And as I said in the presentation, uh, the tactics that catch a 15 inch walleye aren't necessarily it's tac the best tactics to catch a 20 inch walleye. Uh, they, they school by size quite often and uh, bigger fish eat, do eat bigger baits. And uh, so uh, if you're catching small walleyes or not catching walleyes at all, you need to change how you're fishing. You need to tar try a different tactic, a different location, different speed, uh, or a different time of day and uh, to have success on the walleyes. But if you're catching the little ones now, please throw them back gently. They're, they're gonna be legal soon. And I, th I think 2022 and 2023 are gonna be really, really good years for 15 inch walleye. So, uh, Hopefully that pans out. Uh, generally speaking, the, our, our YOY survey is a pretty good predictor of uh, future fishing success. And so we're hoping that those two year classes provide angling for the next five, 10 years plus. I mean, they do live a long time. If they don't get harvested, they live quite a long time. And perfect, Tim. I mean, that's gotta be awesome news for the anglers in Pennsylvania and any of the anglers that come here to fish. Uh, Pimatuming has been known for great walleye fisheries, great musky fisheries, and it's definitely good to hear that from the biologist that covers and, and oversees and studies that lake. So we appreciate your time today, Tim, and uh, just thank you for being with us and answering the questions that were provided. And, uh, you know, I just want to look ahead till tomorrow and uh, 10 a.m. We're going to talk with Jared Sayers again about the trap netting for broodstock on Pimatuming Sanctuary. And then at 2 p.m. tomorrow, we'll talk with Jared Sayers about the walleye spawn at the Linesville State Fish Hatchery. So I'll kick it over back to you, Andy, if you want to finish this section off, and uh, we'll we'll go from there. All right, sounds great, Chad. Yes, thank you, Chad. Thank you, Tim, for your time this afternoon. Uh, just as we're wrapping things up here, I'm going to share out <clears throat> the Hunt Fish PA one last time. Just to remind everybody for, for this afternoon session, just to remind everybody about huntfish.pa.gov. 
You can go on to your app on your mobile, or you can go onto the mobile devices. It's very user-friendly for mobile devices or go on your home computer to purchase your fishing license, to get to renew your boat registration or to get launch permits for those paddle craft. Uh, Pennsylvania fishing license dollars go directly back to conservation so that our agency can continue to protect, conserve and enhance the Commonwealth's aquatic resources. All right, thanks for tuning in with us. And as Chad mentioned, we'll see you at 10 a.m. tomorrow. Thanks, Chad. Thanks, Tim. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Good luck this year. Good luck. Yep. Good luck, fishermen, fisherwomen.